This podcast is part of E2C Network, where we share the whole Auburn experience. Hello and welcome to War Horses, the only college equestrian podcast that's got some pretty exciting news about the Golden Score Sheet Awards. But we're not going to talk about that just yet. I am your host, Auburn Elvis. What we are going to talk about is some college equestrian, and we're going to kick it right off with some Some meat meat recaps. recaps. Okay, our first meet of the week was Swanee at Sweetbriar. Um, I predicted this was going to be eight to nothing or ten to nothing, depending on how many riders there were. It ended up being seven to one. This was another one of those Mutu meets where you got four uh, riders in fences, you got five riders in the flat, and uh, yeah, Sweetbriar won fences three to one, and they also won the flat uh, four to nothing. So. That, there was a tie there. Um, nice meet for the Vixens. They did what we thought they would do to poor Swanee. Um, but, you know, hats off to Swanee because they did get a couple of points. Uh, we did not have a lot of stats on their riders, but now we have some. So good job to them. Now, I will say the Sweet Bar did leave a bunch of zeros in their score sheets and some blanks. Uh, that's not good. We'll cover more of that later. Moving right along, Auburn at Texas A&M. So I thought this was going to be close. I thought it would be 11 to 9 Auburn. It did not end up, well, it ended up being 11 to 9. Here's how it went. Uh, This was a big meet. Uh, First place in the SEC was on the line. Auburn looked a tiny bit better in the stats, but A&M ended up riding better, and that's all that matters. Fences went 3 to 2 for A&M. So right there, alarm bells should be going off that Auburn did not win fences. You know, start panicking, Auburn fans. Uh, flat went three to two for A and M again, suboptimal. Uh, horsemanship went three to two for Auburn. Good, good, good. You want to see more of that? We did not see more of that. Instead, what we saw was in raining. It went three to two for A and M. So that's how we got our final score of eleven to nine. But it was A and M getting the eleven and Auburn getting the nine. Auburn had chances all day, but A and M just rode better basically. Um, even if this meet had ended up tied at ten ten, which was you know close to that. A&M had the better scores across the board, so they were going to win the tiebreaker anyway. So, yeah, uh, just not Auburn's day. Uh, Big home win for A&M. They're going to stay number one in the SEC, and they make a really big case for being one of the best teams in the nation, which they are. They are one of the best teams. Uh, Moving right along, Baylor at TCU. Now, TCU, uh, I thought was going to win this. 14-5, 14-5, to five, it ended up being 14-6, to six. so pretty good there. Uh, Baylor started off good in this meet, so depending on how, you know, certain events start, you know, which ones are in the first half and which ones in the second, it can give you an interesting view of how close it is. So Fences, I think, went first. That went 3-2 to two for, ba- for Baylor. And then Raining, I think, was next, and that went 3-2 to two for TCU. So we were tied at 5-all at the half, and you're thinking, okay, Baylor's in this. Well... <laughs> Flat went four to one for TCU, and horsemanship went five to nothing for TCU in the second half. So just like that, a close meet turned into a rout. Nice home win for TCU. They got to close out the fall number one, undefeated. For Baylor, well, they still have a couple of meets coming up. Uh, they're going to get ready for, and they may be able to get some more wins uh, before the fall's over. So, but for our uh, recaps, we're going to go back uh, over to Saturday and look at Swanee at. Lynchburg. All right, so Swanee Tigers, they just got uh, beaten up by Sweetbriar, and now they're going over to Lynchburg. I thought this was going to be another 8 to 10 or 10 to nothing, depending on the number of riders. It ended up being, uh, let's see, what was this? Well, this ended up being a kind of a weird score, 5 to 1. This was a 4 on 4 meet. Fences went 3 to 1 for Lynchburg, and then the flat went 2 to nothing for Lynchburg. So, yeah, had a couple of ties, and yeah, but uh, anyway, 5 1 score. For Lynchburg. Uh, Lynchburg is going to remain perf- perfect at home with this win for Swanee. Obviously, um, they're not up in that realm with the top teams, but they're getting some points against them or at least tying them in a few, th- you know, head to head rides. And that's pretty good for them at this stage. So we'll keep an eye on them and uh, see how that goes. Now, over we go to Auburn at SMU. Now, I predicted this was going to be a, n- a close one again, nine to eight for Auburn. It did not end up 9-8 to eight for Auburn. Uh, boy, and this one was... Cl- this was another one of those cases where, depending on which events happen when, it seems really close. So, Fences started out... It went 3-2 to two for Auburn. And Horsemanship uh, was also in the first half. And it went 3-2 to two for Auburn. So, right there at the half, Auburn has a 6-4 to four halftime lead. They're looking good. 
And you figure, well, if Auburn can just sort of hold serve and win the rides that they're favored in, uh, especially in raining, then they would, you know, take this meet. But SMU had other ideas. Uh, SMU won the flat 4-1, to one, and then they won raining 4-1 to one as well. So just a devastating second half. Um, SMU had great scores, and they outrode Auburn in the second half. Uh, the big win for them. Uh, they don't have any road wins yet, but they've got some away meets coming up, and they're probably going to change that. So there you go for them. For Auburn, this was disappointing, no doubt about it. Um, you know, it started out and looked good. Looked like okay, Auburn can take this. I'll tell you, in raining in particular, uh, that actually the stats favored Auburn four to one in that, and the reverse happened. So disappointing. Um, but I will tell you, Auburn fans, listen up. Here's the secret no one else is going to tell you. If Texas A&M had gone on the road this weekend to SMU and Auburn, Texas A&M would have lost both of those meets. If SMU had gone on the road to A&M and Auburn, they would have lost both of those meets. And if TCU had gone on the road to any of these two teams, those other three, they probably would have lost both. In fact, I'll say that they would have lost both as well. All four of those teams are right together, and it really just depends on whether you're riding at home or you're riding away as to whether or not they're going to get a win or a loss against each other. Now, against the other teams lower down, um, you know, they'll get home and road wins against just about anybody. But when you're in that top tier, as all four of these teams are, it really just depends on who's home and who's riding the best. But one week, one team will win, and the other team, the other week, they'll lose. So it's going to make for a really nice finish to the season if this keeps up. But for right now, even though Auburn lost two back-to-back, it's not the end of the world because literally anybody would have done that as well, riding against teams of that caliber. So, uh, yeah, road back-to-back road meets are tough. I've got my notes here. Um, you use the other team's horses. I don't know if y'all are aware of that. Um, um, uh, also, you have to learn two sets of patterns. So if you go over to A&M, they've got their sets of patterns. Well, SMU's got another set of patterns. So you've got to learn two and ride them in back-to-back days. But Texas A&M is only learning their set of patterns and, and SMU is only learning theirs. So another advantage built in for the home team, if you do double up like that, and of course, you double up like that to save a little bit of money when you travel. So everybody does it. Um, so yeah, you're on those unfamiliar horses. You're having to learn multiple patterns and all that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you, the silver lining here is this is exactly the same kind of situation that you find yourself in when you're in the postseason. You're on the road, you're on un- unfamiliar horses, and you're having to compete on in a different set of patterns every day. And if you look back last year, SMU, they went on a three-meet road trip through the SEC, and that's how they ended their season. And that really helped them prepare for Ocala because every day they were having to do new sets of patterns, new sets of horses against a very strong opponent, and it, it really got them ready for the postseason. So even though March and April are pretty far away, hopefully Auburn can use this experience as a way to get ready and get used to the difference of what it's like being on the road and having multiple meets on the road as opposed to just you know riding a single meet at home which is a lot of what Auburn has done so far. All right, so the last meet of the weekend was Sacred Heart at Dartmouth. I predicted this was going to be Dartmouth by three. It ended up being six to two, so pretty close. Uh, Fences went three to one for Dartmouth, and Flat also went three to one for Dartmouth. So nice home win for the Green. Uh, You got the win at home. That's what you wanted. For Sacred Heart, they did okay. You know, if they'd have gotten another point or two, then you could probably talk yourself into thinking, hey, we might could upset one of these teams if we could get them to come back to our our place. Um, But as it is, that probably won't happen or at least won't happen anytime soon. So, uh, but it was a decent road performance uh, regardless. So that's all of this week's action. And with that, we uh, have some more score sheets we want to talk about. So let's take a look at this week's Golden Golden Score Score Sheet Sheet Award. Now, the Golden Score Sheet Award is a competition where each week I review all of the official score sheets and I award deductions or bonus points based on the number of errors I find or if a team puts the home team on the right-hand side of the score sheet, which is how it should be done in American sports. Every t- uh, team begins the season with 100 points, and at the end of the season, the team or teams with the highest point totals will win an actual award from me commemorating their achievement in outstanding records keeping. Now, this week, we had our first perfect score sheet, and when I say perfect, not only did this score sheet not have any math errors or incomplete data, 
this score sheet also received the first ever bonus award for putting the home team on the right side. And I gotta tell you, this is a pretty great day for college sports records keeping. Uh, TCU hosted Baylor, and their score sheet also had the home team on the right, and it was wonderful. Um, Now, I will say, the next day, Lynchburg, uh, at least on their digital score sheet, the one that you can go online and see how everybody's doing right now, they put the home team on the right in that as well. And if you go to their website and download the score sheet, you get a copy of that digital one uh, that's basically a, a spreadsheet that's been converted to a PDF. And it also, of course, has the home team on the right. Now, I'm not 100% sure if that's what got officially submitted to the NCEA because they have not been posted yet on the uh, website. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold off on giving them the five-point bonus, okay? But we'll, we'll go back and look next week or sometime later this week and see if they deserve that bonus. So if on the official score sheet, if the home team is on the right, they're going to get a bonus as well. So they may have more than 100 points just like uh, TCU now does. As things stand right now, we have one school in first place in first place with a better than perfect 104 points is TCU. In second place with 100 points are Berry College, Bridgewater, College of Charleston, Lynchburg, but maybe not for long, Minnesota Crookston, Sacred Heart, Swanee, SMU, and UC Davis. In 11th place with a score of 99 points are Dartmouth, Fresno State, Georgia, and Oklahoma State. Down at 15th place with a score of 98 is Baylor. In 16th place with a score of 97 is Texas A&M and UT Martin. In 18th place with a score of 96 are Auburn and Delaware State. In 20th place with a score of 92 is South Dakota State. In 21st place with a score of uh, 91 is South Carolina. And and, and down in 22nd place with a score of 70 is Sweetbriar. So yeah, Sweetbriar, they had that other score sheet with the, a bunch of blanks in it, so they dropped another 10 points. Sorry about that, Sweetbriar, but you're, you're really the only team that's doing that, so I'm, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't defend that. Um, but yeah, uh, we have nine teams that are at the perfect 100. We'll see how that continues. I will say that some of those are probably not going to have home meets, and if you don't have a home meet, uh, you, I'm going to bump you out of this competition. I'm not taking anybody out of the the rankings just yet or the standings just yet. I'll do that in the uh, spring. So, yeah. All right. So, with all of this week's action out of the way and we've talked about the Golden Score Sheet, the next thing we want to talk about are the official Auburn Elvis Elvis College College Equestrian Equestrian Rankings. rankings. All right, so the dual discipline uh, rankings have been shaken up a little bit because of the action, so let's jump right on into it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new number one. This week's number one is the person in charge of the score sheet layout at TCU. Just a girl that loves frogs. Just a girl that loves frogs. I don't know who you are, mysterious score sheet layout person, but I want you to know that I love you. And it's okay if our love remains anonymous because it's not based on physical things like knowing each other. Instead, it is based on something much more important, which is how awesome you are at laying out score sheets. So, yes, you are proof that this world can get better, and you are this week's number one. Now, coming in at number one dash B is TCU. (laughs) The Horned Frogs dispatch Baylor at home, ending their fall campaign with a perfect 6-0 record. They are also the only team in the nation, besides Delaware State, that is still undefeated. Number two this week is SMU. The Mustangs defended their home turf again this week by dispatching Auburn, so they will rise up to number two in the rankings. Now, it's important to note that the Mustangs have not won on the road yet, but with a pair of meets out in California coming up this week, that could change. Number three is Texas A&M. The Aggies rebounded from last week's road loss to SMU with a big win over Auburn at home. The win completed their fall schedule and keeps them atop the SEC standings all by themselves. The number four team is Auburn. The Tigers lost a pair of tough road meets that probably would have tripped up anyone else in the country, so they're only going to drop to number four. 
Also, Tiger fans, the spring schedule begins with two more road trips, but then it's nothing but home meets until the postseason, so things are probably going to get better for Auburn in the spring. Number five is Georgia. As we pointed out, the Bulldogs can win at home, but they haven't looked great on the road so far. Luckily for them, their last meet of the season, in the fall at least, is at home. Number six is Oklahoma State. The Cowgirls have a similar resume to Georgia, and this week we are going to see if the Cowgirls are one of those teams that can win on the road. Number seven is South Carolina. (laughs) The Gamecocks have a good team this season, but that home loss to A&M says that the Gamecocks probably are not in that top tier of teams right now. You just got to win your home meets. All right, at number eight is Delaware State. For the last two months, I have been beating the drum for the Hornets, even though they only have that one win against Minnesota Crookston on their resume. That is about to change this week. So we'll see if they live up to their number eight ranking. Number nine is UC Davis. Hello, you. The Aggies have only ridden road meat so far. But this weekend, they're going to get a shot at number two, SMU, at home. And number 10 is UT Martin. As we've covered before, the Skyhawks have had one of the toughest schedules this fall, but it gets a little easier this final weekend before the break. If they can pick up a win or two, expect them to move up even higher in the rankings. So on we go to the single discipline rankings. At number one, we have... The unknown person in charge of the score sheet at Lynchburg. Just like your counterpart at TCU, you are a perfect flower of loveliness on your own level of awesomeness. And at 1 B, we have Lynchburg. The Hornets defeated a decent Swanee team at home and remain number one because, and I want to point this out to everybody, they have an impressive road victory, which was at Dartmouth. And no other single discipline team has a road victory that impressive. So to everyone who is not putting them number one in your rankings, you are a victim of recency bias. The complete resume should matter. And that resume is strongest for Lynchburg. Well, and the person who did their their score sheet. So anyway, on we go to number two, which is Sweetbriar. The Vixens are a great team, but they did lose on the road at Dartmouth, and their biggest road win is Sacred Heart, which we know is not as good as Dartmouth because Sacred Heart just lost to Dartmouth. The Vixens did beat Sewanee this week at home, so they're going to stay right here at number two. Number three is Dartmouth. The Green beat Sacred Heart at home. They also beat Sweetbriar at home a few weeks back, but they have no road wins, and the difference between a good team and a great team is can you beat good teams on the road? So far, Dartmouth can't. Number four is Sacred Heart. The Pioneers lost on the road to Dartmouth, so they'll stay below them. Uh, Their fall is done, and there you go. (laughs) Number five is Barry College. The Vikings still have not ridden an NCEA meet this season. I rechecked the stats, uh, and all of the other teams, basically uh, everything's going to stay in this bottom part of the rankings. is going to stay the same because we just don't have enough data to make me comfortable about moving anybody above uh, Barry right now. So uh, according to the NCAA calendar, like I mentioned, Barry um, is about to face uh, Swanee. Uh, they're going to go on the road to Swanee in two weeks. And that will give us a data point on the Vikings. And so we'll actually get to see, are they for real or not? Number six is Bridgewater. Like most teams, Bridgewater is done for the fall. So now they're just going to sit and wait and see what the other teams around them end up doing. Number seven is College of Charleston. The Cougars are also done for the fall, and they too will just sit around and see what happens with Swanee and Barry. The number eight team is Swanee. 
The Tigers didn't look bad this week, even with the pair of losses. Like we said, they have that December meet coming up against Barry, and that could change their rankings. So, the fall is coming to a close for most teams, but we still have some action coming up, so let's take a look at some Some meet meet previews. previews. Okay, on Friday we have three meets, the first of which is Baylor at Delaware State. Oh boy, I tell you, I have been waiting for this for a long time. A lot of y'all might not realize this unless you're a fan of Baylor or Delaware State, but this is actually a very important meet. If Delaware State wins this, this is really going to help their chances of making it to Ocala in April. And we've seen that Baylor is having a down year right now, and this is a very winnable meet for the Hornets. In fences, these teams are close, but Baylor does have a slight edge, so we're going to say that that goes 3-2 to two for the Bears. On the flat, Baylor again has a small edge, but a lot of this is going to depend on the random draw. Delaware State has a pair of riders who could beat anybody on Baylor's roster, but after them, the scoring really kind of drops off, whereas Baylor, Baylor has one superstar, they also have a a girl that's pretty much an All-American, and then they have some solid riders. So depending on how the draw matches everybody up, um, somebody could win big or not, and yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see. But you're not, you're not listening so that you can hear all these if-thens and possibilities. You really want a number. So I'm going to take the easy way out and just say that flat goes 2-2. Two to two. <laughs> Horsemanship. Uh, Baylor is not as good as Delaware State in horsemanship. Uh, the Bears are going to struggle to get at least two points. So I'll say this one goes 3-1 to one for Delaware State. And in reigning, Baylor has one rider who is very good and four riders who are not very good. Uh, Delaware State doesn't even have one great rider, so I think this is going to go 3-2 to two for Baylor. Add all that up, and I think De- Delaware State wins a 9-9 to nine tiebreaker. So, wow. Very close. We'll see if that ends up happening. Next, we have Oklahoma State at South Carolina. Statistically, these two teams are very close, so let's see what the numbers project. Um, in fences, I think uh, Oklahoma State squeaks out a 3-2 to two advantage there. On the flat, I think South Carolina wins that 3-2. to two. In horsemanship, Oklahoma State looks stronger. I think this ends up being a 3-1 to one win for them. And in reigning, uh, Oklahoma State again looks stronger, so I think that goes 3-2 to two for them there. Add all that up, and I think the Cowgirls win this one 11-8. Then we're going to have SMU at Fresno State. I think SMU wins fences 4 to 1. I think SMU wins flat 4 to 1. I think SMU wins horsemanship 3 to nothing and I think SMU wins reigning 4 to 1. Add that up and I think the final score is going to be something like 15 to 3 SMU. Then over we go on Saturday with Oklahoma State at Georgia. Now this is going to be very interesting. The numbers say this is going to be darn close. Fences is going to be a battle. I think Georgia is going to take that 3 to 2. Flat should go 3-2 to two for the Bulldogs as well. Horsemanship is even, so we're going to say that goes 2-2 two to two for everybody. And in reigning, I think the Cowgirls will take that one 3-1. to one. Add that up, and it's a 9-9 to nine tie. And I'm going to say that Georgia gets the tiebreaker win. It is at home, and you just ride a little bit better at home. Then we have a neutral site meet between Baylor and UT Martin. In fences, I think Baylor wins that 3-2. to two. In the flat, I think that ends up 2-2. Two two. In horsemanship, I think Baylor wins 3-2. to two. And in reigning, I think UT Martin wins 3-2. to two. Add that up, and it looks like Baylor is going to win 10-9. to nine. So the next meet after that, we're going to have UT Martin versus Delaware State. Here, I think fences goes 2-2. Two to two. I think flat goes 3-2 to two for Delaware State. I think horsemanship goes 4-1 to one for Delaware State. I think reigning goes 3-2 to two for UT Martin. Add all that up, and I think Delaware State is going to get the win 11-8 to over UT Martin. And this weekend's action is going to conclude with SMU at UC Davis. I think SMU wins fences 3-2. to I think UC Davis wins the flat 3-2. to I think SMU wins horsemanship 3-2. to And I think SMU wins reigning 3-2 to as well. Add all that up, I think we're going to see an 11-9 to win for SMU. Okay, so we are getting close to the end of the fall season and the winter break. In next week's show, there's not going to be an Auburn meet to talk about, so instead of that, what I'm going to do is a recap of how the fall went for all the dual-discipline teams. I'm going to skip the single-discipline teams 
and just do a special mini episode for them that following week because there will be that very exciting Barry at Swanee Meet to talk about, and that's going to be a nice setup to do the the single discipline rundown. So if Auburn fans want to skip that mini one, that's okay. Um, one other thing, uh, Instagram. A lot of y'all are all of y'all are on Instagram. Speaking to the writers, the coaches, the parents, all y'all. Um, and sometimes y'all will message me with questions or comments or stuff like that. And sometimes I miss seeing those for several days. Basically what it is, is I, I like to pull up Instagram at my desk computer. And so it uses the web version, which is very poor at showing notifications and messages and stuff like that. So um, over this fall, there have been several times when y'all messaged me about things and then I missed them <laughs> for days or a week. And I feel real bad about that because I feel like, oh, man, you bothered to, you know, point out I messed up whatever or the name here was wrong. There was like a, a meet that was a four on five meet and uh, I completely left off the bottom line and one of y'all, you know, pointed it out. Now, that one I did notice. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry if I miss it. You know, it's I'll try to do better at it. But, you know, if if you do message me and then it takes like a day or two before I reply, it's probably because I just didn't notice the notification. Sorry about that. But yeah, no, I really like getting those messages. I am totally down with explaining to you why I did not pick your daughter to win her meet um, or her, her head-to-head ride. Um, which, oh yeah, um, I've said this before, but let's cover it again. The whole reason that I do those head-to-head matchup favorites is so that fans can have a context going into the meet of of just where these two riders are when they meet each other head-to-head. If you just read the social media posts coming out of these schools, well, of course, every rider should win every point forever uh, for that team. But if you're somebody like me, uh, if you have me showing you, hey, this girl here, her win-loss record isn't as good as her opponent, and her opponent happens to be the great Augusta Iwasaki, and with the two of them met last year in the national championship meet, Iwasaki won, and as she often wins. Uh, and then uh, this meet happens, and you see Ellie Ferrigno's actually beaten Iwasaki, then hopefully folks can appreciate that, man, that's that's amazing. That's a huge, dang, big achievement. Um, you know, SMU ex- probably expected to get that point, but then Ellie Ferrigno went out and she changed the narrative. So when stuff like that happens, and, and basically it happens every meet, I think that's pretty cool because if we didn't see what those favorites were going into it, a lot of the people would not grasp the significance of an outcome like that. So that's why I do it. Hope y'all are cool about it. Um, oh, I will say one mom came up to me not too long ago and she said that her daughter came up to her after her event and was all sad. It was like, Auburn Elvis picked me to win and I lost. So, oh, you know, that's that's not what I'm going for, but I guess it happens. Oh, well. Um, let's see what else. Oh, um, I will say I was also asked, somebody did ask me, Hey, is there a direct link we can get to, to get to those darn podcast uh, episodes? And I'll say, well, not through like Spotify or any of the podcatchers or anything like that. Uh, because what's going on is, all right, there's this dude, Kyle. Okay. And he has a whole bunch of Auburn themed podcasts for the various Auburn sports. And, um, and so he groups them all together into one, you know, podcasting network. So if you subscribe to E2C Network, you're going to get a lot of Auburn, uh, podcasts. Yes. So for Auburn fans, it's great. Uh, but for the people who are really only concerned about the equestrian stuff, yes, you do have to, you know, either listen to some very entertaining, uh, Auburn stuff, or you skip through that so you can get to the equestrian thing. Cause again, this is the leading equestrian podcast out there. And so, yeah, but but the reason we do it is because, frankly, Kyle does all the hard work and I don't have to do anything. <laughs> it's great. I record myself, I give him the file, and he does all the work. So I get it that a lot of you people who are uh, just equestrian fans, it's a little bit of a hoop y'all have to jump through. But let me tell you, it makes my life so much easier. And I'm so appreciative of Kyle doing that. And, I, and y'all are too, because frankly, if he didn't do that, there might not be the number one college question podcast out there. Uh, so, you know, it's either this or nothing, basically. But anyway, yeah, good job to Kyle. And he's the voice that you hear sometimes doing the little ads here and there. So, yeah, he runs stuff. So big thanks to Kyle. We all appreciate what you do. Now, that said, I did ask Kyle. I said, hey, what, you know, is there a direct link or anything like that? And he, what he does is he also puts the episodes onto YouTube. 
and there is a playlist of just the War Horses episodes. I don't know what that link is. It's pretty long. It's some big long link. But what I'll do is I will put it in my bio this week, and that way you can just click on it and, you know, tag it, favorite, whatever. And that way you can jump straight to it and and just go through that. Because I think YouTube has controls now for just using YouTube as sort of a podcasting uh, platform. But I don't know the details on that. And, you know, you kids out there with your technology, I'm sure you can figure it out. But all that to say, there is an easier method to get to it if you don't want to listen to all the wonderful Auburn stuff. But for you Auburn fans, don't y'all go to the directly. You listen to all, all the Auburn stuff. And some of you non-Auburn people, it would it's educational. Y'all need to see how the other half lives. So anyway, that's all for this episode. I am your host, Auburn Elvis. I thank you very much for listening and War Horses. Thank you for tuning in today's episode on the E2C Network. On your way out, I want to remind you to stop by E2Cnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for all our content across our podcast, YouTube channel, and much more. To stay up to date with us, make sure you're following social media accounts such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. While our content here may always be Auburn sports heavy, if it's orange and blue, it's what we do. War Eagle.